Welcome to worship here at Aylmer Baptist Church on this Easter Sunday, the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We pray that the wonder of the resurrection will be very real to you today and that Jesus will be honored as we remember his great triumph over sin, death, and Satan. This is the last Sunday that I will be sharing with you. Next Sunday begins a new chapter in the history of Aylmer Baptist Church as Reverend Dr. Michelle Belzeal begins ministry here. I know that the congregation has been looking forward to his arrival for several months. Later in the service, Pastor Michelle will take a few minutes to introduce himself. But I want to take this opportunity to thank you for the privilege of ministering to you these past four months. I've enjoyed meeting some of you and working with the Deacons Board and the Worship Planning Committee, as well as working with Carol McFadden and Brad and Darlene Irwin. It really has taken a small army to create these online and video worship services. I'm only sorry that I was not able to meet more of you in person, but I've appreciated the opportunity to get to see some of your faces during the coffee break after the service has been premiered. It's been an honor to lead worship and preach in this historic church where so many great people have ministered before. I hope that sometime in the future, I will be able to join you for worship in person. Thank you once again. Let us hear the word of God as it comes to us from the book of Job. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, today we come together to celebrate the most miraculous miracle in the history of the world. A man who had been dead for three days came back to life, not through medicine or the skill of doctors, but by your power. By human standards, this man should not have survived the flogging, the crucifixion, the spirit of the heart. Humanly speaking, what happened was impossible. Even modern medicine could not have saved him. But thank you that with you, nothing is impossible. Thank you that through the resurrection, Jesus showed his power over sin, death, and the grave. Thank you that through this miracle, we have hope for life beyond our earthly lifetime and eternal life with you. Thank you that we can come into your presence today in Jesus' name to bring our sacrifice of praise, worship, and thanksgiving. Be with us during this time of worship. Teach us, encourage us, build us up in our faith, and be glorified through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
In 2 Corinthians 8, the Apostle Paul writes, But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. May we excel in the grace of giving to God's work in His church. Every gift is important. Thank you for your faithful giving to the work of Aylmer Baptist Church. At the end of the service, you will see a list of ways in which you can contribute. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for the hope and assurance that it gives to us. Thank you that we have the privilege of worshiping you through the act of giving. Accept these tithes and offerings with our love and thankfulness. May both the gifts and the givers be used to bring to you glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
or good morning and happy Easter. I'm celebrating Easter today from my home in Toronto where I've been packing books because at the end of the month, I'm moving to Elmer. In fact, I started working at Elmer Baptist Church this week. I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Michel, or Michelle, or Pastor Michelle. Now, that's not really the, the, the name that my parents gave me. My, my parents gave me a, a longer name. Uh, the name they gave me was Joseph Robert Michel Belzil. Quite a mouthful, eh? For that reason, when I had French friends, they used to call me Michel, and my English friends used to have a nickname for me. They used to call me Mike. And all through high school and university, beginning of university, I went by Mike. And then when I moved to Ontario, people started calling me Michel. And so you can call me Michelle as well. What about you? Do, do you have a, a long name or a short name? Is, is it hard to pronounce for some people or is it a, a pretty common name that's easy to pronounce? Maybe you, you have a nickname. Well, as your new pastor, I'm looking forward to getting to know you by name. And I'm kind of hoping that eventually you'll get to know me not only by my name, but by my voice, even when I have to wear my mask. I'm hoping you'll be able to recognize my voice. Well, until we get a chance to meet face to face, I want to wish you a happy Easter and we'll talk again next week. Bye for now. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day he be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. <laughs> Yeah.
Let's pray together. Great God and Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today acknowledging that you are great and greatly to be praised. You are the high and lifted up one, the holy one, the all-knowing one, the almighty one, the eternal one, the source of all wisdom and knowledge, the great creator and sustainer, the only one who is truly worthy of worship. We praise you today that you have revealed yourself as a God of love by sending your son Jesus to this earth to be our redeemer. Thank you that he went to the cross for us, taking all our sin upon himself to, the, to, the sacri- to be the sacrifice that needed to be made to provide atonement. We praise you for forgiveness of sin and eternal life through Jesus. We praise you today for Jesus' resurrection that demonstrated that his sacrifice was acceptable and that it had the ability to provide forgiveness. We confess that we are not worthy of his sacrifice. We confess that we are sinners in our nature, our thoughts, our words, and our actions. We confess that like the Apostle Paul, we often do the things we should not do, and we do not do the things that we should. We are susceptible to temptation, and often we fail. Thank you that forgiveness is available through Jesus. Thank you that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that when we turn to you through Jesus and confess and repent of sin, you cast it into the sea of forgetfulness and will never hold it against us. We thank you for the many ways, many other ways in which you show how much you love us. Thank you for providing for us day by day. Thank you for the ability you give to to earn a living. Thank you for food to eat and clothes to wear, homes to live in. Thank you for our families and the ability to love and be loved. Thank you for strength and protection during this pandemic. Thank you for healthcare workers who care for us when we are sick. Thank you for the vaccines that are now available and we pray that soon we will be able to worship together. We thank you for Elmer Baptist Church and thank you for the provision of new pastoral leadership. We pray for Pastor Michel Belzile as he begins ministry here. We pray for fruit from his ministry and we pray that both the pastor and the congregation will be bright lights shining for Jesus in this community. Today we especially thank you for Jesus, for his life, for his wonderful sacrifice for us on the cross and for his miraculous resurrection from the dead. Thank you for the hope and assurance that these events give. Thank you for forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Thank you for the assurance of heaven. We pray today for those who are sick, that they may experience healing. For those who mourn, that they may be comforted. For those who are in distress, that they may find help. For those who are lonely, that they may find friends. We pray for our missionaries, that you will protect them and that they will be encouraged in their ministries and see fruit from their labors. We pray for our leaders, that they will be men and women who seek your wisdom as they make important decisions that will have an impact on each of us. May they not rely on their own wisdom, but recognize their need of you. We continue to pray for Elmer Baptist Church and the ministry that we carry out here in Jesus' name. May we be his hands and feet carrying the good news of the gospel into this needy community around us. Once again, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you together. Be with us through the the remainder of this service. Teach us, bless us, and be glorified through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I don't know about you, but I have mixed emotions when it comes to surprises. I know there are good surprises. I've seen a lot of videos of the surprised looks on future grandparents' faces when they're told that there's a grandchild on the way. You know the surprised look when they open an envelope that they think contains a birthday card and they find an ultrasound picture of a grandchild. Or they open a box that contains a t-shirt with the words, world's greatest grandma or grandpa, when they didn't even know that a grandchild was on the way. Some of the people are shocked into silence with silly grins on their faces, and others can't stop screaming in excitement. We've all all probably seen the, the look on the faces of people who arrive at a destination to discover that there is a party being given in their honor. These kinds of surprises are good ones, but then there are the not-so-good ones, the unexpected bill in the mail, the unexpected telephone call telling you that something bad has happened, there's been an accident, or someone has died, the un- unexpected declaration by someone else that uh, we need to talk, and right away you know it's not going to be fun. Sometimes surprises can be baffling, like opening a gift and either not knowing what it is or wondering what in the world possessed the giver to think that you would like that. And I've seen that look on my wife's face many times in the last 40 years or so. Well, today we think of a surprise that the followers of Jesus received three days after they had watched him die on the cross and then be buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. In the Gospels, we read the story about what happened to three women who walked to the tomb carrying spices that they planned to use to anoint Jesus' body. Now, these spices were not an attempt to embalm the body, but they were spices to be used to to mask the smell of of a decomposing body. The names of these three women were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. And they set up Uh, they set out very early on Sunday morning just after sunrise and as they walked and talked about all that had happened one of them raised the question how will we get in the tomb they had been been there when Jesus body had been placed inside they had watched as the large and heavy stone door had been rolled into place it took more than one man to roll that stone door And the women knew that it would take an equal number of men to roll it away from the door. Now, I don't know why it took them so long to think about a a practical question like that. But I guess we've all been guilty of deciding to do something without really thinking about the logistics of, of how it will actually happen. Like starting a project without really thinking about how we're going to be able to pay for it. Or how we'll find the time to actually do the work or how much skill it will take to accomplish the work, or how much time it will take. Like deciding to remodel a kitchen without first researching how much it's going to cost, how long it will take to complete, and where we're going to do our cooking in the meantime. Well, the women going to the tomb of Jesus obviously hadn't thought things through. They fully expected that when they arrived at the tomb, um, it it would be shut up tight. And I wonder if they kept, they, they kept going while thinking, well, we'll just ask those nice Roman soldiers to roll the, the stone away from the door for us, as if that was likely to happen. The guards would be more likely to wave their swords and threaten the women to stay away. But when the women arrived at the tomb, they found something that they never expected. They'd been worried about rolling the stone away from the door, but they discovered that it had already been done. They may have thought that their job had just gotten a lot, a lot easier. And they were surprised, and they were curious at the same time, and they actually went into the tomb, and they were greeted by a young man wearing a white robe. And in Matthew, he's described as being an angel. He told them that he knew why they had come, that they were looking for Jesus who had been crucified. But then he gave them the good but unexpected news that he wasn't there because he had been raised from the dead. He had been raised from the dead. It was a surprising turn of events. They were shocked. They were surprised. 
Now, they really shouldn't have been too surprised because Jesus had often told them or, and, his, and his other followers that he would be raised from the dead. He would said that the sign of Jonah would be given, just as Jonah had been inside the stomach of a giant fish for three days and three nights, he would be in the tomb and would be raised. He told his disciples in Matthew 17, and 23, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. It couldn't have been any clearer. He couldn't have said it in any, any more clear way. But of course, the followers of Jesus never really listened to things like that. They could not believe that something like the crucifixion would ever happen to the one they believed to be the Messiah. And being raised back to life after crucifixion was not something that anyone would ever think was possible. So the three women were surprised to find the empty tomb. And they weren't the only ones who were surprised. The disciples, even those closest to Jesus, Peter and John, they were surprised. In fact, they were mystified. Luke 24, 12 says that after Peter ran to the tomb and saw the strips of cloth lying by themselves, he went away wondering what had happened. It wasn't it obvious, but he was surprised. The resurrection of Jesus was a wonderful surprise. Nobody expected it. But once they got over the initial shock, they were thrilled that Jesus had, been, had returned from the dead. But you know, and even, even greater than being surprised that Jesus had been raised from the dead is a surprise that he would even be willing to be raised. If, if I were Jesus, and I'd existed uh, from all eternity in the beauties and wonders of heaven, and then had been sent to live here on earth for 33 years, I would be tempted to think that that should be enough. 33 years away from heaven should be enough. And if I were Jesus and God the Father told me, you have to go back, I would be inclined to say, you've got to be kidding. You want me to go back to the place where they rejected and crucified me? Wasn't 33 years away from heaven, wasn't crucifixion enough? I'd rather not go back. Can't I just stay here with you in heaven? A Lutheran writer named Walter Wangerin uh, wrote a little book titled Reliving the Passion. And in the chapter on the resurrection, he tells a story from the perspective of Mary Magdalene. And as she tells Peter about what she saw in the garden at the empty tomb, she says, I stared at the tomb and I thought, how he loved me. How he loves me, loves me, Peter, plain Mary from Magdala, who had seven devils once and no prospects. And it was enough that he loved me so long as he lived, but then he died and it was nothing. But now think, Peter, think how terribly mighty that love must be to rise from the dead. Peter, do you understand what I'm saying to you? This is the love of Almighty God, the Father. Now, right here, think how terribly mighty that love must be to rise from the dead. The resurrection is a great and wonderful demonstration of the love that God the Father and Jesus Christ the Savior have for us. Only a terribly mighty love would cause the Father to send the Son to earth the first time, and only a terribly mighty love would cause Jesus to be willing to return. It was a terribly mighty love demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus. Well, why was that terribly mighty love shown in the resurrection necessary? Why did it have to happen? Well, the first reason the resurrection had to happen was to demonstrate the victory over sin. As unpleasant a task as it might have been, it was necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead to demonstrate that he had indeed been victorious over sin. If his body had stayed in the tomb, everyone would think he had been defeated. The religious leaders and and Rome would have had the last laugh. 
they would have gotten rid of that troublesome or troublemaking rabbi. The disciples would have gone back to the work they were doing before they met Jesus. Everything would have gone back to where it had been before. People would say, well, we had hoped he would be the one. But he was just like the others. He disappointed us because only losers are crucified. But Jesus had to come back from the grave to prove that he was worth believing in. He had defeated death. And by emerging victorious from the grave, he showed that he had conquered it. That he had conquered sin. In the margin of my study Bible, I wrote a quote that I read somewhere. That Jesus died to pay for sin. He was buried to take them away. And when he was raised, they stayed in the grave. His resurrection demonstrates that. That our sins stayed in the grave. When he was on the cross, he took all of our sin upon himself. As Paul says, he became sin for us. And he took those sins to the grave with him. And when he rose on the third day, he left them behind. Romans 6.23, Paul says, For the wages of sin is death. Because of our sin that he carried on the cross, Jesus died. But because they were our sins, not his. Because of his inherent holiness and perfection, death could not hold him. Death had no claim on him. He was raised. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The terribly mighty love of God was demonstrated not only on the cross, but also in the resurrection. The resurrection demonstrated that there is hope for forgiveness. In Romans 5.8 Paul says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he might as well have added, and was raised for us. Because through the resurrection, God demonstrates that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was sufficient payment for sin. Through the resurrection, he demonstrated that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb whose death could atone for the sin of the whole world. We can be made clean in his eyes because of what Jesus did for us. It is a terribly mighty love. Another reason why Jesus had to be raised is to show Satan that he had lost the battle. When Jesus died on the cross, I'm sure that Satan... Our great enemy was beside himself with joy. He thought that his scheme had succeeded. Judas, the Jewish religious leaders, and the Romans had all played their parts perfectly. The Son of God was dead. Human beings were Satan's for the taking. But the resurrection proved Satan wrong. The resurrection demonstrated that the cross was all part of God's plan to redeem the human race and make it possible for people to be reconciled to him. We didn't need a dead sacrifice. We needed a living Savior. And in the resurrection, Jesus showed that he was the one. I really like the symbolism of a song by John Moyer. It's called, He Holds the Keys. And in the song, he paints the picture of Jesus descending into hell after his death. And the words go like this. His grave becomes a door. He enters in to face the author of all sin. Defying death and the grave, he takes their keys, and with them every captive frees. And from death's barren womb, the captives cry, Arise, for our redemption draweth nigh, for he holds the keys. He holds the keys. The reason for the captives to sing, Arise for our redemption draweth nigh, is because Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He was raised. And in his resurrection, he opened the gates of sin and death that keep, kept people in bondage to Satan. 
And Jesus himself says in Revelation 1.18, I am the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys, the keys of sin and Hades. In his resurrection, Jesus proved that he is the one who is capable of freeing us from the prison of sin. Because he gave himself on the cross, it's as though he was able to snatch the keys to our prison out of Satan's hands and release us. And now we are free from our bondage to Satan. He no longer is our master. Jesus had the authority to set us free. A few years ago, one of Hollywood's uh, top movies was called 12 Years a Slave. A free man named uh, Solomon Northrup was kidnapped, and he was sold back into slavery. His family had no idea what happened to him, and he had no way of contacting them. But finally, after 12 long years of backbreaking work and abuse, he was able to send a message. And one of the most dramatic scenes in the movie is when a white man arrives at the plantation and demands that Solomon Northrup be released. And of course, the slave owner objects as far as he's concerned. Solomon is his property. But the friend who has come presents proof that Solomon is a free man who had been sold illegally. He gets back his freedom. But of course, the plantation owner is not happy because he lost a valuable slave. Well, in a way, this is what Jesus has done for us. He's taken us away from Satan, our old master. Satan may protest, but Jesus says, I died for them. You have no rights over them. And in the resurrection, he demonstrated his authority to make that claim. His terribly mighty love was shown in the resurrection because it demonstrated that he had the right to free us because he has won the victory over Satan. Third reason why, the, why Jesus had to be raised, why he demonstrated his terribly mighty love in the resurrection, was to show that new life is possible. To show that new life is possible. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22, Paul says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus had to rise from the dead to prove that through faith in him, we can be raised from our deadness in sin to eternal life. The Bible teaches, as I've mentioned uh, uh, on other Sundays, that there are, the Bible tells, tells us that there are two different kinds of death. There is the physical death when our body stops functioning and begins to decay. But there's also spiritual death, which is alienation or separation from God. And we are subject to both because of sin. When Adam and Eve uh, lived in the Garden of Eden, God warned them to not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because uh, by eating it, they would die. Eating it would result in death. The Hebrew actually says, dying, you will die. But when, so when they ate the fruit, Adam and Eve died spiritually because their relationship with God was damaged. And later on, they died physically when their bodies aged and eventually their hearts stopped beating. And since then, every person who has ever lived has suffered the consequences of sin. Even Jesus died on the cross because of our sin that he carried. He died physically, but he also died spiritually. He was separated from his father. He cried out in loneliness and desolation, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But just as Jesus was restored to fellowship with his father because of his obedience, even to death on the cross, we can be restored to fellowship with God because of Jesus' sacrifice. Instead of being dead in sin, we can be alive in Christ. And when this happens, we can be sure that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too can be raised to new life. Paul writes in Romans 6, 4 to 5, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, 
in, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with, with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits. The fact that he was raised from the dead gives us the hope and the assurance that we too will be raised. And just as the body of Jesus was recognizable but, but different when he was raised, he could uh, appear and disappear at will, he could walk through walls, well, we too will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says that just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. And verse 51, the dead will be raised imperishable, for the perishable must put on the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Jesus has a new resurrection body waiting for us. It's because of his terribly mighty love in the resurrection. The terribly mighty love of God is shown in the resurrection. And on this Easter Sunday, let's be thankful that the resurrection demonstrates Jesus' victory over sin. It demonstrates his victory over Satan. And he demonstrates, he shows us, he promises that new life is possible. It's a guarantee, not just a promise. It's a guarantee. New life is possible because the terribly mighty love of God in Jesus was shown in the resurrection. As Jesus was raised, we too shall be raised. Let's bow together in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the wonderful celebration of Easter, the resurrection. And on this Resurrection Sunday, we give you thanks for Jesus and for the terribly mighty love that you've shown to us in him, not only in his crucifixion, but also in his glorious resurrection. Thank you, Father, that in his resurrection, he demonstrated his power over sin, his victory over Satan. And thank you that in his resurrection, he guarantees that we will be raised with him through faith to new life. Father, we pray that the, the power of, of the resurrection will be very real in us, that each one of us will have the assurance within our hearts that Jesus is our Savior by faith and that we too will be raised with him. So, Father, we thank you for one, this wonderful Easter Sunday, for this wonderful celebration, and we thank you for Jesus, our crucified and our risen Savior. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.
of kings.